Good morning. Thanks for being here. Canaletta, you're the premier media writer in this country. Checks in the mail. Checks in the mail, but it's true. The, the breadth and scope of the dozen books that you have done and the way they hold together on such varied topics as Wall Street, advertising, the news business, uh, on and on, a dozen books, and there, it's a um, remarkable body of work. And now into this mix comes a monster, Harvey Weinstein. 20 years ago, you write in the New Yorker a historic profile of this man. What was in it? What did it say? And what didn't it say? Well, what it said, it was in 2002, it was, and, and um, I spent a lot of time with him. At first he said he didn't want to talk. I said, fine, I'll do it without you. And of course, that's, that's how you plea bargain, and, and, and he, he agreed. What was in it was that he was a monster. He abused people verbally. I knew, I believed it was true that he abused women sexually. And I heard of an incident that took place at the Venice Film Festival in 1998. And at the last interview I did with Harvey, we did probably 15 hours of taped interviews. And I sat in his office and watched him over a period of time, to talk to various people. It was probably a four or five month project. But in the last interview, it was just he and I in a small conference room. And I said, Harvey, tell me about Rowena Chu and Zelda Perkins and what happened at the 1998 Venice Film Festival. That's when they were doing Shakespeare in Love, or showing it at, at the Venice Film Festival. And he said, what do you mean? And, he, and he, he's very volatile. He's a volcanic personality. And I captured that in the piece. But I wanted to capture his abuse of women, which I believe was true. And he stood up and moved over to my side of the, he was across from me, I was seated, he was standing, and he's clenching his fists, and his lip, his lower lip is like this, and he says, if you write that, it will destroy my family. It, you can't write that, it was a consensual affair, and I thought he was actually gonna take a poke at me. So at that point, I stood up, and we were roughly the same height, I was probably 100 pounds less than he, uh, but I was raised in Coney Island, so we had some He's fighting jock, experience. He's the jock, not Harvey. <laughs> trust, trust me, I played ball with him. And, and at that point, he did one of the most shocking things I've ever experienced as a human being or a journalist. He started to cry. And he said, you can't do that. It will destroy my kids, my two teenage daughters, blah, blah. And he really took on a different voice, and it became a different person. So he thought we were gonna run the story. I had the two women's names. Rowena Chu was so lost somewhere in Asia. I couldn't find her. Zelda Perkins was, in, was raising horses in Guatemala. I tracked her down and she hung up the phone. She says, I won't talk to you. So all I had, and the woman who told me about it, I can now say it on the record because I put it in my book and she agreed. Donna Gigliotti, who was the producer in Shakespeare in Love, was the woman who told me about this incident, because she was very close to, and she was served as a mentor to the women um, in part. Uh, in part, they blame her for protecting Harvey, later blame her. In any case, Donna said to me, I said, Donna, will you go on the record? And she says, only if the women would go on the record, will I consider going on the record? So I had nothing, so the New Yorker then had to make a decision. We confronted Harvey, he, he asked for a meeting, thinking we're gonna run the story. He comes up to the New Yorker in his uh, typical confrontational way, and he says, you're not gonna run this story, and I'm sitting there with, next to David Remnick and next to our lawyer. He comes up with David Boys, his lawyer, and he says, if you run that story, I'll sue you, you can't run that story. And David Boys taps him on the arm, and he says, Harvey, there's a First Amendment in this country. You can't have prior censorship of, of the publication. Okay, okay, and then I took over and I said, all right, Harvey, here's what I want. And I actually came up with what I thought was a reasonable scheme. I said, if I could show how they paid almost $500,000, I knew that figure, 
to these two women to sign an NDA. If I could show that Miramax, his company paid for it, or the parent company, Disney, paid for it, someone's going to jail. I don't need the women to talk to me. I got the story. And he said, oh, am I going to do that? I said, tomorrow, Harvey. It's Tuesday. Thursday is our deadline. You got to come back tomorrow with the canceled checks we want to see. Came back the next day with his brother, Bob, and they slid across the table two checks from Bob Weinstein, personal checks. So we didn't have a story. And they did, David Remick made the decision, which I concurred in. We don't have, we can, we're not the National Enquirer. We, we, we can't write rumors. And he said, when I was at the Washington Post, we did a story on Senator Bob Packwood harassing women. And it was a front page story. We had 20 women on the record saying that the senator abused them. We had zero women. Tough question. Then another 20 years goes by before we hear anything about the extent of his actions, actions being a really understatement of his predatory horror. Almost a quarter of a century goes by and nobody does the story. Not you all, not those of us at other institutions who have heard a good deal from our friends in the in the business about Harvey and, and what goes on to some extent with, with women? Is, is this one of the great journalistic failures of our time? Well, you know, you could argue that or you could argue that we have to have sourcing. And we had no sourcing. Harvey got these women to sign non-disclosure agreements. They kept their mouths shut. I'm, and I'm, the enablers. I'm going to go the other way on Go ahead, here. please. I, I'm, I'm going to say that given the numbers and what the institutions are, journalistic institutions that have known in that period about Harvey Weinstein. I, you tell me, and I don't know the answer, that's why I'm asking you, how many of those inst institutions in damn near a quarter of a century put reporters full time on this story and said we need to revisit this? I don't think they did. I'm not even sure they knew about what this was. New York Times time. certainly had some notion. The Washington Post had some the, the notion. The gossip columnists knew, and they, had, and, and they were, I, many of them were bought off. They, they would be invited to his parties, his premieres. He would give them book contracts or script contracts. Don't forget, he had a publishing house. He had a magazine he was doing, and Miramax was doing movies. So he, he, he Harvey, if, uh, a way to write about Harvey, which I tried to do in this book, it's a portrait of power and how he used it and abused it. But Carl, I, I'm not challenging your basic argument that in fact, the, you could look back and say the press failed. They, they failed to, to expose this guy. And did I fail to expose him? I mean, I tried a number of times in succeeding years to go after him. The first time it ever became public that Harvey had abused women potentially was in 2015 with the Italian model. And if you remember that case, she claimed that Harvey grabbed her breasts when he invited her to his office and put his hand up her leg. And she went to the police, the first woman who went to the police in all the history of women he had abused. That's the only time anyone ever went to the police. And it got in the press. And Harvey for the first time is exposed publicly. But then what happens? The DA decides not to prosecute we'll, DA We'll get Vance. to that part of the story okay. in a minute and in fact, Harvey is once again escapes. Uh, exactly. So while this is going on, we're talking about a gigantic figure, literally and figuratively, in the history of Hollywood, who has changed the way Hollywood works, its ethic in terms of giving us a plateful of great films unlike anything being done over a quarter of a century once, once again. Is this something like, like Wagner, uh, this, this monster who produces this incredible art and changes the culture of, of what his art is? Well, there's no, you could actually make an argument that some of Harvey's flaws 
were part of his virtues in making movies. His determination and stubbornness to just do this, the way he bullied people into submission. Um, I mean, there's any number of examples which I share in the book of him doing that in making movies. But, I mean, for instance, the original person who, who, who did Shakespeare in Love wrote it, designed it, got the screenwriting for it. Harvey, he went to Harvey for backing. Harvey said, I love it, I'll do it. And then he threw the guy out. That was Harvey. He was just, you know, he was a brutal, ruthless son of a bitch. But if one of the interesting challenges for me in writing this book was to write about someone who I think of as a monster, and yet to, in a biography, which this was, to acknowledge and explore his talent. How transformational a figure is he? Well, you could make an argument that in, there were independent movie companies before Harvey and that existed while Miramax was in the, but no one had the record of movie. Yeah, I'm just looking movie. at, at the, the list of them. Pulp English Fiction. Patient, Goodwill Hunting, Shakespeare in Love, Lord of the Rings, Gangs in New York, Chicago, Kill Bill, Fahrenheit, 9-11, and of course you got Pulp Fiction at the beginning and on and on, Inglorious Bad, Django, wow. It's and if you talk to Tarantino, which I did when I was doing the New Yorker piece in 2002, he said, I, I, I love working with Harvey. And it, people found him difficult, but I loved, he would challenge me. Harvey, among his talents, was he read a lot. And he really was good with the script. He understood that the key to a good movie was not the director or the actors, but the first thing was having a good script. And he doctored scripts and worked on it, to the point sometimes he was called Harvey Scissorhands because he was too intrusive with directors. Is he a sociopath? Is he a psychopath? Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I, I tried, as, as you know. Amateur, go ahead. Yeah. Psychologist. I, I spent a lot of time with, with psychologists and, and experts in, in his, his kind of behavior. And I, I kept on looking at the beginning for a rosebud. And if you go in the book, Certain things happened in his childhood. Um, his mother was a very, Miriam Weinstein was a very domineering. Mama Portnoy. Mama Portnoy, he called her, and she yelled all the time. And Harvey and Bob, in their business life, yelled all the time. That was clearly a reflection of the, a mother who had normalized yelling. But Harvey, as a kid, did not, I could find no example in my interviews of his childhood of him ever abusing women. He goes to the University of Buffalo and drops out after his, senior, after his junior year. I found no evidence of him abusing women. He didn't date very much, and, and he, but he wasn't fat, and he wasn't as ugly as, as, he, as he became. <laughs> but then something significant happened. He, he drops out of Buffalo to create a rock promotion company, Harvey and Corky Presents. And Harvey and Corky Presents becomes a really dominant rock promotion group. Paul Simon, you know, the Rolling Stones, Frank Sinatra. I mean, they had everyone come up to the Buffalo, Western New York area, and it's very successful. And that's when he first started raping women, when he had power. So what I found in my exploration with the psychologists and psychiatrists, and with people who were familiar with this kind of behavior, was that Harvey was a sociopath. And a sociopath generally has three key definitions. One is narcissism, two is lack of guilt, and three is lack of empathy. Now, you can have all three of those and not be a sociopath. I mean, I, I can think of several people, including a former president, who might qualify in that regard. You just said an, an amazing thing I, I never thought of until you said this, and, and I want to consider for a moment his repellent physicality. No, not in, not in, not in a, a laughing way in the least. As disfiguring, perhaps, to the psyche of a young person. Because we know an awful lot from women about this. Women have told us and taught us about the beauty myth, about how supposedly, quote, ugly, women perceived by men as, quote, ugly, and, and what that has done to the psyche of women. Is this a factor in here? Well, you know, he, in the trial in New York, which I was there every day, um, 
the women on the witness stand described his body, his body odor, the pimples on his back, the, uh, the deformed areas around his, his penis. It was quite extraordinary. And at one point, the DA passed to the jurors. They took photos, five photos of Harvey Newt. And they did it because they wanted people to, to know that what these women were saying about his body was anatomy was, was, was true. And one of the things that was fascinating, I sat where I had a direct line sight of, of the jury, and they would pass the photos, and the, and the jurors would go, and they didn't want to look at it. It was really, it was quite gruesome. And we never saw the photos in the press or the public. But he is just, uh, to listen to descriptions of his body anatomy in this, it, I mean, I, I kept watching him in the trial. How's he responding to this insult? I mean, it, it just, it, and he just sat there with his head down. Sometimes he fell asleep. It was, it was really a weird experience. Well, this is, this is a weird, to understate once again, episode, and yet at the same time, there are elements of it that are emblematic. The casting couch that goes back to before there were talkies. So what, what do we know about Harvey's experience in the era of the end of the 20th century and the first part of the 21st century, and, and what gives? I, I, I address that question in the book, uh, and there's no question the casting couch goes back to silent movies, and it goes back to power, male power over, over the women. And though there are some examples throughout history, Louis B. Mayer arguably raped Judy Garland. Um, and there are other examples of physical abuse. But the casting cast in general was seducing, and you want this role in this movie. There's a difference between what Harvey did and the casting couch. Harvey raped women, raped them. And that's not casting couch. That's a criminal offense, which is what he was found guilty of. of. How much, back to this question of, of the casting couch, rape, how much of the context of what this story is about also exists in a lot of other institutions oh, totally. with a lot of very powerful male figures? We, we can uh, tick off, you know, Charlie uh, Rose, Les Moonves, well, Mario Batali, you can go down the list. So. Is this tale more universal, perhaps, than you set it up to be in the construct of the book itself? Yes and no. It, 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 it is more universal in that men sexually harass and sometimes abuse and often abuse women. That, that, that is true. But again, I think you've got to make a distinction between what Charlie Rose or Matt Lauer is accused of is not rape. Uh, it, I'm not excusing their behavior, but it's not rape. Harvey was raping women. Yeah. And I mean, for instance, it, one of the most, I, I write in the book that one of the most significant moments of the trial is there was a woman by the name of Jessica Mann. She was one of the five women who testified. And she, what she said was, and she, she was a neurotic, she had issues, um, and, and she kept coming back to Harvey. So her credibility was, was, was questionable. And Harvey's attorney, Donna Rotono, who was a woman who believed that a woman could interview and ask tough questions of women on the stand better than a, a man could. And maybe that was true, and she has a good record of succeeding on behalf of her male clients. But what she did, she had, Jessica was on the stand for, for three days. And the last day, the first day she came in, she looked like a starlet. By the third day, her hair was now curly, not straight. She had a shine on her forehead. And she was crying all the time. And Donna Rotuno just machine gunned her with questions. And, but too many questions. And at one point, the judge is saying, ask your, your question, Ms. Rotono, you, you're repeating yourself. And so, but she couldn't help herself. She just borrowed in, portraying Jessica as this neurotic person. And Jessica then 
took over and she looked at the jury, which was literally from here to that sign close to her. And she looked this way and she said, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I know that, that I've got a lot of questions in my, behavior, my past, a lot of questions about my behavior with Mr. Weinstein. And I know you have reasons to ask questions about that. But ladies and gentlemen of the jury, one fact is undeniable. On March 25th, 19, whatever the date was, I'm not like John Meacham, I can remember dates, but <laughs> on that day, Harvey Weinstein raped me. And when she said that, chills ran down my spine, ran down the, my colleagues in the press because we talked about it afterwards, and there was silence, and you knew it was a transformative moment in that trial. There's another great character in this book, and that's Bob Weinstein. Who is he, and what's, what part of the tale is his? Bob, including the Hollywood tale. Well, we know that Bob paid for the non almost $500,000 out of his personal check accounts because he, when I confronted him about it, he said it's because Harvey said he was having an affair, which is what he said to me, with Rowena Chu, and Rowena Chu threatened to let's go public. be sure we go back to childhood. Let, let's go back to childhood. Bob was two years younger than, than Harvey, and he was called Bobby. And two years is a big difference in junior high school and elementary school. So they didn't pal around as they later did as adults. Bob always followed Harvey. Harvey goes to the University of Buffalo. Bob goes two years later to Fredonia. Bob joins Harvey's company as a junior employee, not a full partner. Then at Bob's instigation, they form Miramax in New York. Bob goes first. Harvey sells the business. Miramax, the name coming from? from the mother and father. Miriam and Max. And Bob and he were equal partners. Bob yelled just as Harvey did. I found no evidence that Bob abused women the way Harvey abused women. But they were very close. They talked five, six times a day. Their offices were side by side. Over the years, they began to drift further apart. Harvey um, was yelling all the time, was spending money all the time. Bob was a better businessman. Bob was trying to rein Harvey in, stop spending, Harvey, stop picking up tabs and all that. We, 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 we can't afford that. Bob became an alcoholic, and Bob entered AA in the late 90s, and he reformed his life, and he became a, a, a nicer person. He wasn't a nice person in those early years. He was like Harvey in terms of yelling and of, of being verbally abusive to people but he became a nicer person. And people who you interviewed said that Bob was a nicer person and we liked him more. But in the end, what happened was that Bob killed Harvey. In the end, Bob said he didn't know that Harvey was sexually abusing women, to answer your question. But he knew he, he, had a, he was a sex addict. That's where I'm going he, here. And he said he tried to get him to enter a therapeutic program the way Bob had entered AA, and, and Harvey resisted. And Bob ultimately decided to fully cooperate with me, and we, I, I mean, I probably spent 20 hours of taped interviews with him. So he was an incredible source, and particularly a credible, incredible source about his monster brother. And the mother, I mean, Bob is the one who reaffirmed what, what Harvey's childhood friend said about the mother. She, my mother was a monster, he said. Well, without trying in any way to minimize uh, the horror of the predation or what this person did, and given what Bob has told you, have we given enough consideration in the Harvey Weinstein story to the question of, of is more of this attributable in some way, not just to sociopathy, but to addiction? To addiction. You know, you could say you're, you're addicted to sex, um, but there's a difference between being addicted to sex 
and raping women. And, and if, you, if you go through, as, the, as you did in the court and as I have in the interviewing, and, and, and the two pioneering books before me, um, both Jody, Jody Cantor and, and Meg Toohey at the Times, she said, and Ronan Farrell, um, they did brilliant reporting on women and what Harvey had done. I was writing a biography, which is a different kind of a book. But I owe so much to them, and we all owe so much to them, and the incredible work they did. And I, I don't think you can compare and, and, and say, well, if you're an addict, naturally you yeah. are the next no, step. I don't think so. it would seem to be in, in a different league than that. So now we, we come back to the question of journalism and, and where this fits in how we're covering particularly Hollywood, media. There's an awful lot going on right now. The business is changing profoundly in all of media, and particularly in, quote, Hollywood. What's the next story to look at there? Where, where do we go? If we want to find out what's really going on, who the players are, what, what's really going on right now? Well, I, you, you got to get one of the things that enabled Harvey to persist and exist for so long in his monstrous behavior are the enablers, people who knew. Let me tell you a story, for instance. When, uh, Chris, when I interviewed people who worked for him over the years for the book, they would say to me, I knew he was abusive and I knew he, he you know, uh, was not kind to women, but I didn't know. He did all this stuff. Well, Hillary Silver was a woman I interviewed, and she went to. She was an agent. She went to work. Very attractive young woman at the time. She goes to work for Harvey, or, or she goes in for a job interview. She's in the elevator with Harvey, who eyes her up and down. He says, "What are you doing here?" This is in Tribeca offices. He says, "Well, I'm here to meet the head of human resources for a job." He said, "Come and see me when you're done with the head of human resources." Sounds like a typical Harvey move. So she goes to see Human Resources, and she's finished with the interview, and she says, Mr. Weinstein said he'd like me to come by. Oh, great. So he, the head of Human Resources follows her into Harvey's office, and, Har and Harvey says, how'd it go? And he says, fine. And he, Harvey points there and he says, you're fired. You're hired, I'm sorry, not fired. You're, you're hired. And he didn't interview her. He didn't a ask any detailed questions. just hired her, based obviously on her appearance. And so she was scheduled to make a three-week trip and then start work. The day before she's to start work in Miramax, she gets a call from an executive in Human Resources and said, Hillary, we'd like to take you for a drink before you start. And she says, great. And she gets off the phone, she thinks, what a wonderful place to work this is. I mean, they're just welcoming me to this Miramax community. She goes to, for drinks with four people, the Human, Res Human Resources, director, or associate director, uh, another two executives within Miramax, and one of Harvey's four assistants, right? And they say, Hillary, you don't want to come to work here. And she says, why? What are you talking, why? And he said, because he will assault you, if you, sexually assault you if you do. She didn't go to work for Miramax. But that story tells you a lot. And what it tells you is how widespread the knowledge was of Harvey physically abusing women. For instance, any number of women, Amy Israel, any number of other executives who worked there, w would say to me, I would never let Harvey meet alone with a woman who worked for me. I said, why? This is all on the, on the record in the book. I said, why? He said, because I knew he would abuse them. And so I never let them meet alone. So it was widespread knowledge that people are in denialism, that it wasn't widespread knowledge, that Harvey was physically abusing women. So the neighbors are part of this story. A big part. Which is why the subtitle of the book is The Culture of Silence. Let's give folks here a chance to ask questions. Come up to the want, microphone. Come on up to the mic, if, if you would. First of all, I read your profile in the New Yorker years ago, and I was indelible. It's absolutely stunning. 
Thank you. I have two quick questions. One, have you heard from Bob about this book? Yes. And two, I don't mean to be cynical or give me a man when he's down, but I've seen Harvey Weinstein with his walker. Does he really need the walkers at a play for sympathy? Uh, Bob, Bob, yeah, I'll answer both. Bob, uh, Bob did read the book, and he, he thought it was fair. Uh, and, and people, when, when you hear me say that, may wonder, did, did you go too soft on him? And in Harvey's case, this was a common refrain during the trial. He would come in in a wheelchair or a walker, actually, at the time. When he was sentenced, he was in a, by the time he was sentenced in March 2020, he was in a wheelchair. He has stenosis. And, and, it, and he had a back operation, uh, and it's really bad. He has a stent in his heart. He has severe diabetes, though he continues to eat chocolates. He's blind in one eye from glaucoma, and he's going blind in the other. Harvey's in, in, in terrible physical shape. That's not a lie. It's not a fake. It didn't help him with the jury in any case. Right. Yes, ma'am. So my question is, um, how much do you think that other studios and just the culture of Hollywood played into it because even when people say, well, he sexually assaulted, but some of them went along with it, but if you said no, you weren't just no dead to Miramax, you were possibly dead in the industry, period. I mean, and like, what has been your sense of why people cooperated with this culture of like, once he decided, no, don't work with her, even though you were hearing the rumors, why would then other folks go along with it? Harvey, uh, I mentioned power, and in part my book is a portrait of, of his power. And Harvey understood something Donald Trump understands, and I'm saying this neutrally, that a key to power is fear. People have to fear you. And either the, the non-disclosure agreement he'll get him to sign, the money he'll take, the fact that if you challenge him, he will sue you and you'll be in a court case you can't afford to be in against someone who can't afford it. You, someone who will ruin your career. Any number of women in my book and in Jody Cantor and Meg Tui's book and, and Rona Farrow's book, women who say, claim that their careers were harmed by Harvey after they rejected his advances. Yeah. Hi, I'd like to comment on the um, culture of silence. I was at Warner Brothers as a music consultant in Los Angeles from about 1991 to 2005. Um, I'm sorry, I'm a little nervous. Um, I know a woman who was assaulted by um, Cosby. Um, I never met Weinstein, but I was, a, like I said, I was a music super in music licensing, and we had to go on a lot for film, television, commercials. My boss, who was the head of West Coast Operations, never sent a woman onto, onto a Miramax project because he knew. And when I started, uh, and these men and women, there are women who are abusers too, they, they tend to go for young women under 30, attractive because they're easier to control, they're easier to yell at and, and abuse and that sort of thing. Um, and I'm so thankful that Weinstein, like I said, I never met the guy, but I heard stories about him. What about all the others? <laughs> well, there are a lot of others and some have been nabbed and many haven't been. And, but the pressures now, I mean, you read stories of people who, who were actually, look at Governor Cuomo. Governor Cuomo was really forced to resign, not because he, he did what Harvey did. I mean, the argument that he sexually harassed women, but it was also because of his behavior. The kind of behavior that Harvey was famous for at Miramax, yelling at people, it is no longer acceptable. I, I got a question for the audience. And that is, how many people in this audience, which is in my quick survey, is weighted with more women than men, right. think that the culture of this country has changed since because of Harvey and because of Harvey and the Me Too movement? Or do people here think the culture remains? How many think the culture really has changed? Raise your hands. Changed? Raise your hands. And, and how many think it hasn't? Interesting. Uh, slightly yeah. more the first hand raised, and, but only slightly. And, and women and men seem to, their answers proportionate. Interesting. By the way, if you read today's paper news, one of the big stories is Donald Trump. 
That's right. And the woman, and it looks as if the DA uh, in Manhattan is about to indict Donald Trump for basically trying to silence a woman. Yes. Hi. Um, oh, that's loud. Um, so the question I was going to ask is similar to the previous question, is how many more Weinsteins are out there. But I also wanted to just comment as a psychologist, I'm not clinical, but I'm social, and uh, there's a lot of experimental research out there that supports that power corrupts, and I think this power is a big part of that. But the question was, you know, how many other Weinsteins are out there? I think we've... They're out there. I don't think... That by the way, that, that it is commonplace among men who sexually harass that they're raped the way Harvey did. I mean, the, the gruesomeness of the things he did to women are just extraordinary. And, and I don't think that is, com is common. That doesn't mean that, I mean, if you read what Les Moonves, the head of CBS did, when he went to a, psycho a doctor who he didn't know happened to be an attractive doctor, and he literally, uh, took out his, his his penis and started and then tried to force her down on him. I mean that's unbelievable. I mean he thinks he can get away with that because power, but that was the closest thing to what Harvey. But Harvey actually would not have let the woman out of the room. Has Moon has been rehabilitated? No. He's actually one of the things that's really interesting. The only uh, there are two people I could think of that have been rehabilitated after being exposed as sexual abusers. One is Bill O'Reilly, whose books are number one bestsellers, despite the fact that he paid tens of millions of dollars in NDA agreements, and some of which was paid by Fox. And the other is Donald Trump, who may now be uh, about to face it. Both but of whom, all the whom operate in a particular cultural political Nish. cohort in yeah. it raises all kinds of questions about but think about all the other people who have no comeback Matt Lauer has no comeback Charlie Rose has no comeback Mary Vitale has no comeback and but, come back but and those two are in a particular political cultural cohort that may be more forgiving because of yeah, but, you know, I'm but, just suggesting. But think about it. One just of the things really, think about event think about evangelicals supporting Donald Trump. See, when it's all about I, I morality. My, I, I rest my cake. <laughs> Hi. Um, I first want to just say there's a big difference between the culture is changing and the culture has changed. I think that I raise my hand that the culture has not changed. I do think that steps are happening towards changing but I think we are a long way from changed. Um, You're I, right, I should have asked a better question. <laughs> Thank you. Changing is a better word. You're absolutely right. Um, and I also have spent many years now in the performing arts industry, um, and I want to um, flag that uh, the, um, the way in which you are speaking casually around rape versus sexual harassment and sexual assault is um, a, a big thing because as actually in the last panel on this, Treva Lindsay, and I wanted to make sure I said her name right, the author of the last book here, said, spoke to the ways in which rape is baked into our culture in the society, it is baked into the history and the framework of our society. There is a big, um, there, actually it's not big, it's a thin line between what we consider to be rape today and what was rape 20 years ago, 10 years ago, consent culture and the ways in which consent culture also has been changing in particularly performing arts and film. Um, and I sat in so many rooms when the Weinstein uh, story broke and the conversations in there around the open secret of this. He is an extreme case, but he, the ways in which the um, culture of misogyny and the patriarchy in the industry is so prevalent for young women and gender non-binary um, folks and that what, and the ways in which we don't teach consent to young people and we don't cons teach consent to young performers and we don't, and men, 
the ways in which um, that power corrupts to the point where, um, to, to, and it's not all, ca I, the casting couch is such a big conversation, but um, the way, it just, it, it's, a, it's a thin, thin line, and I know many people who have straddled that thin line, never said anything, don't, won't ever say anything, um, and, uh, and I just think we need to be really conscientious of that when we talk about the other Weinsteins out there, quote unquote. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Last quick question, quick answer. Okay, quick question. Um, I agree with everything she said, but want to make one point for a question, which is what are your thoughts, more of your thoughts, about the difference between sexual harassment and what it could lead to and rape? Knowing that you've already said rape is terrible, it's awful, it's criminal, but sexual harassment is, can be criminal too, and it can oh, be it is civil. Criminal. So I just would like to hear you talk a little bit more about that, because I don't want to Personally, I don't want to take away from the touching, the kissing, whatever they right. say to you at work or at home or in sports or whatever. Well, for instance, if you take the Matt Lauer case, uh, Matt Lauer, uh, w w the, the official claim at NBC was that he sexually harassed some women on his staff. One of the women, I don't know whether it's true or not, has never been adjudicated, she claimed that it wasn't just sexual harassment. He took me in his office and he literally physically raped me. A and I, because I was working on today's show and he was the boss, I was intimidated and I kept my mouth shut and I, I didn't do anything about it. So that's a thin line example of harassment merging. Good. I wanted you to say that. Thank you. <laughs> the, um, I'm going to cut off the questioning now and get in the last question myself. One man, you're right. We're going to let a man go ahead. Go for it. Thank you all. Thanks. I didn't think I was going to get to ask. Um, you said you talked to Quentin Tarantino, and I was wondering if you found him to be either reluctant to criticize or even flat out defensive of Harvey Weinstein, because he's kind of defended Roman Polanski in the past. And he also called Harvey Weinstein a father figure. So I was just wondering if And also, Quentin, Quentin Tarantino actually was one of the enablers. And I say that because he was dating um, Maria, Maria Savino, and who told him, he acknowledged this in print, that she told him that Harvey physically abused her, as did uh, the woman who was in three of his movies um, Uma Thurman, and, and both, he said, I knew, and I should have done something about it, and I knew from them, and I did nothing about it. So he's a neighbor, and, and that's, Good question. that's kind of what I thought. Thank you. So the last question is, Canaletta, you've had this amazing run, this incredible achievement, both in magazine pieces and in books, what's the next project? Where do you go now? Uh, Murdoch. You know, I've got this theory, and I'm going to pass it back to you. That really, there are three or four people in the last half century who are the most important and powerful people in the world Murdoch, Pope John Paul II. Steve Jobs, Gorbachev. You don't get much past that list. What do you see as, as what you want to learn more than anything that you don't know about Rupert? I, I'm going to be a little diplomatic because I'm in the early stages of reporting and, and I want to get people to talk to me. So I'm not going to announce positions. I, I'm sure you'll understand that. Um, but I, I'm interested in, in, if you look at media moguls over the years, the Hearst, the Luces, the Beaver Brooks, they were powerful on one continent. Rupert Murdoch is the first media figure powerful on three continents, Australia, Europe, and, and America. And his power is profound. He's also one of the more interesting business executives. He's a very bold 
figure i mean for instance in two thousand and nineteen he decides that he's going to sell so much of his twenty first century fox not his newspapers not fox news not some of his cable holdings but most most everything else um, including the studio and why because in his hard-headed way, he looks at the business and he says, I spend $2 billion a year for television, to produce television shows for, Fox, for the Fox network, right now cable network. Netflix spends $15 billion a year, A, and that's rising, and they have a, a market value so much greater than mine that any, one I, any company I want to buy, they can outbid me in a second. So I'm going to do something that's totally unexpected. I'm going to sell the heart of my business to Disney, which is what he did. And if you go back, Fox News, he was losing a fortune on, when he started Fox News, but he believed in it, and now it makes $2 billion a year. Stay the tuned. Fox Network, the same thing. Pardon? Stay tuned. Yeah. Canaletta. Thank you. Thank you very much, Good to job. our panel.